Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. Before we jump into this new episode, we'd like to take a moment and thank you for your continued support. Many of you asked how you can support us. One great way is to subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter. Each month, we collect and curate information about the latest scientific advances in the field, as well as biotech and pharmaceutical news. Subscribe today at drgpcr.com newsletter. We would also like to hear from you. Please take a moment to tell us how to make Dr. GPCR work for you by filling out any of our surveys on drgpcr.com survey. You can tell us what you think about the podcast, the summit, and even Dr. GPCR in general. Stay tuned as we are working on the 2022 Dr. GPCR Summit Edition. And we also have been busy working on a brand new secret project. Visit drgpcr.com to find out more about all our activities. And now, let's dive into this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Yamina from Dr. GPCR. I am excited today to have with me my guest for today's podcast episode, Dr. Sai Prasad Paidi. Hi, Sai. Hi, Yamina. It's so you? nice to meet you. I'm great. I'm great. As you, as you can see, it's pretty early here in the Boston area, but I'm excited to be talking to you today. Uh, I'm also waiting for this from so many days, so I'm excited to talk to you too. Thank you. Thank you so much. So before we hit record, we were talking about the fact that we have uh, Canada and NIH in common. Uh, why don't you tell us your story as a scientist uh, from, from you know, undergrad to where you are today? Okay, sure. So uh, in India, basically after grade 10, uh, we have to decide whether you, know, you want to go for an engineering stream or a medical stream. So after 10th, I thought I will go for engineering. So, so I left biology and I go for math, you know, physics, chemistry. Uh, but uh, in that process, I learned that I'm not very much interested in engineering. And uh, that was the time uh, when, you know, everywhere the biotechnology boom is coming up, like in the news and everywhere you see that, oh, biotechnology is the next big thing. So then I took uh, my bachelor's in uh, chemistry, biochemistry and biotech. And uh, during that time, uh, I developed interest towards uh, biology. So before that, uh, I kind of uh, not really know what to do. Basically, I thought I will do my undergrad grant and go for some job and uh, that's it. Uh, but during my undergrad, uh, so in the biochemistry book, I saw a loose phrase. You know, the firefly, uh, from my childhood, I was fascinated by the light that gives by the firefly. But I never knew that that is just because of a simple biochemical reaction. So that changed uh, my whole life. So then I thought, wow, it's, it's really interesting. So it's just an enzyme. It's an enzymatic reaction that gives light. And that's why we could see this. So then I tried to understand. I developed interest towards biology. So then I pursued my master's uh, in India in biotechnology. Then I went to Canada, uh, to Winnipeg, uh, the coldest place. And uh, <laughs> I did my <laughs> uh, PhD with uh, Dr. Prashant Chilkani at University of Manitoba. So that's where I get to introduce to GPCRs. So my PhD, I worked on uh, structural and functional characterization of uh, the very interesting class of uh, GPCRs, which are bitter taste receptors. So, and then I moved to NIH uh, for my postdoctoral work. So where I worked with uh, Dr. Jürgen Bess at NADDK. So in Feb, I completed my postdoc, uh, Feb 2021. And uh, now I moved back to India and I just started uh, my new journey as an assistant professor at uh, IIT Kanpur in the Department of Biological Sciences and Bioengineering. So this is in brief uh, my journey. Thank you for that. Thank you. And congratulations on, on starting uh, your lab. I, I, I knew that you had recently started, but I didn't realize that it was this year. So I'm, <laughs> I'm even happier to, to, have, to have you. You know, it's been a difficult thing and I'm going to put it out there for, for everyone listening. We're always looking to talk to everyone in the field, whether you're a postdoc, a PhD, 
or newly, uh, you know, newly minted professor from all around the world. So I'm so happy to, uh, even happier to have you with us today. Thank you. Uh, it's still, I feel like a postdoc, but, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm just trying to get into the <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. And I think I think that's something that takes time to get into to that leadership position and to that delegation. I think um, from my own experience, delegation has been a difficult journey because you're so much faster than anyone you work with as a student. You know, you, you've you done this. You went through all the difficulties and you can do the essays with your eyes closed. But now is the time to teach the next generation of scientists. So you you mentioned that you know in tenth grade in India you had to pick you know medical versus engineering, but before that did you what did you want to become when you were a child? So when I was a kid, like just like you know, like I don't have specific idea. I never thought uh, specifically I want to be a scientist. So I just want to do my undergrad and uh, mm-hmm. you know uh, uh, do graduation and uh, and just do some job so that's what i thought but uh, i i really never got exposure uh, to become a scientist because i'm the first generation in my family uh, who did phd uh, so uh, that's what i thought it just go for a job and yeah, that's it but after that's- that yeah I think uh, I think that's that's a great point that you're making is that you didn't get exposure to to what a scientist does and I think that has been the problem for for decades now is that children now it's much better because you know we have YouTube you have all these educational material online for a long time we did not know what a scientist did you know, and there is still that biased view of a scientist in a lab coat and, you know, working late at night. And yeah. even in the movies, um, when, when I see these things or people pipetting the wrong way, I'm like, wait a minute, we need to we need to definitely uh, make a point. And it's not a li- scientist's life to, to spend all the time in the lab and not talk to anyone. We do other things. Yeah, I, I totally like, agree with that. Like podcasting at, at 7 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> or I think I think it's pretty late uh, in India right now. It's, it's evening time here. It's... So, what got you to to go to uh, to Winnipeg? I mean, it's quite a long way from India. Did you look for postdoc pos- or for a PhD position somewhere else, or how did you land in Canada at all? Yes, so. So when I was in master's, so uh, in the as a part of our curriculum in the last semester, we had to do a project work. So I am from the southern part of India, so which is a city called Vishakhapatnam. It's more of a coastal. So I traveled to New Delhi, which is capital. So where I came for a project work and try to explore the options. So initially I thought I will do PhD in India, but uh, some of my co-workers uh, there, they suggested you can explore options abroad. So then I try, I was, I was approaching different people. Uh, at that time, I also approached uh, my post, my PhD supervisor. Um, like, uh, it's my luck, I guess. He was alumni of our uh, master's university, which, where I did my master's. Uh, so he kind of uh, told that, um, you know, we have openings. And he asked me to write, he sent a couple of papers and he asked me to, you know, write a write up and he asked my complete resume. And at that time, I don't even know how to make a resume. So I kind of put everything together and, uh, you know, I sent it to him. Then um, we exchanged a few emails. Uh, then he said, okay, there is a uh, opening in my lab. And uh, uh, then uh, he asked you how to clear the TOEFL. I think for Canada, TOEFL is the requirement. There is no not, no need of GRE. So I kind of appeared for uh, TOEFL and then I went to Winnipeg. So before that, I really don't know like the weather in Winnipeg or anything. I was, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's a it's a great uh, experience. You know, new place, new people, a different yeah. culture, and uh, you know, interacting with uh, different. Um, kind of people and the way the science 
you know, that happens in different parts of the world. And I would say it's, it's really a great experience for me. I love it. Uh, I was just going to ask my next question, which was not scientific at all. Like how shocking was the temperature difference? Uh, <laughs> how did you because a phd so you did what five plus years uh as yeah. a phd i what like the first year i can only imagine because it happened to me too when i moved to, to canada and it's montreal and i think before we uh, we hit record we established that winnipeg might be colder than montreal yes. uh, but the first year it was just so shocking you know that minus 40 degrees with the wind chill in february yeah. is still just just the thought of it Yeah. So, so in India, like, you know, the first thing was like, we see sunset at 5, 5.30, 6.30 at sunset, you know. So I still remember I landed in on July 2nd in Winnipeg. So it's 9.30 p.m. And it's so bright. And that's my first shock. So until 10.30, 11, it's, it's not dark. So uh, still there is some light. So uh, it took some time for me to adjust. But uh, it's uh, fortunately, I went there in summer. So I had the two, three months of uh, you know, time to adjust at least to the place. And uh, in September and you know, October, by Halloween, it's in Winnipeg, uh, there will be a snow. So it was like a, quite an experience. Uh, but it's... Uh, a new thing that's the first time in my life I saw snow so that is a great experience like in the first uh, when it snowed first time I went I ran to my supervisor and I told him oh it's snowing uh, but for him it's not a big deal because uh, <laughs> you know he did his PhD from the same university and he was there for some time yeah so yeah I, I enjoyed and but it it's kind of a shock and but it's also a good experience And it also gave me a lot of time to spend time in the lab because almost six months, uh, there is nothing much you can do outdoors. So uh, you go to gym and you play, you know, indoor sports and then, yeah, you spend time in the lab, interact more with the, your colleagues and try to learn. But the good thing about, uh, I think, in Canada or in U.S. is like people come from uh, different countries, different cultures. So uh, your uh, ideas and, you know, how you see people and, you know, it's, it's really amazing. Like it really helped me to develop at personal level too, to see how different people are. So, yeah. I think you make, you make a great point uh, about the fact that, you know, you, you changed countries to do your training and that not only opens you doors scientifically, you learn new things, but also connecting with, with people from all around the world. I think that's a life-changing experience. Yeah, you put it in right words, yes. It's really life-changing experience for me. It's, yeah. I think, I think it's for everyone, and I would encourage students and postdocs who, who, who didn't get a chance, and if you get a chance to go abroad, even if it's for you know summer or uh, just for some time and work in a different place, that, that That, that absolutely is a great experience that will make your science better, but will also make you grow personally, like, like you put it. Yeah, I totally so agree. In, in Canada, you were working on, on bitter, bitter taste uh, receptors, which are not your common GPCR. Um, did, you, did you choose these family of receptors to work on, or did you get this kind of inherited this project? Uh, so, uh, yeah, so my postdoctoral supervisor, he did his postdoc um, uh, with, uh, at MIT, so where he studied, uh, sorry, my PhD supervisor, so he did his uh, postdoc from MIT, so where he studied uh, GPCRs. So once he moved back to Winnipeg, so he started working on uh, bitter taste receptors. Or maybe one reason might be we are part of dentistry. So I did my PhD from a department of oral biology. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it's like, it's that these T2Rs are discovered only in 2000. Uh, so it's yeah. like, I started my PhD in 2009. So it's not uh, much known about these receptors by then. So I think uh, that's what I'm thinking. So that maybe that's why he started working on that. 
and uh, I just inherited the project and I also worked on uh, Thrombox and Receptors a little bit with others but uh, amazingly I worked on uh, T2Rs and uh, you know there are more than 20 like around 25 T2Rs are present in uh, humans and we are at that time uh, it's not much known so we are trying to identify the lichens and try to understand how these receptors are activated and that is also the time just the crystal structures of other GPs have started coming. So it's a very interesting uh, phase for me as a graduate student. So that, That's fantastic. You mentioned that your PhD supervisor was at MIT. Um, what what lab was he in? Do you remember? Uh, he was working with uh, Dr. Hargovin Kurana. Um, okay. So, so yeah. He- that's that's why I was asking. I just want I didn't want to say it, but that's why I was asking. So so interesting because my postdoc supervisor, Dr. Sakmar, was also at MIT in Gobin's lab. So yes, uh, <laughs> so we had too much overlap. <laughs> yeah, see, we we already we've never met. We got an introduction from from Dr. Shukla, and there we there we are there we are. We we have so many things in common. Yes, thanks, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's a small. The GPCR world is a small world, and, and I'm glad we're, we're talking today. Um, so you mentioned uh, the uh, the bitter taste receptors that you were working on for your PhD, um, and then you men- also mentioned that these were the first GPCRs. This is when you got introduced to GPCRs from from the firefly luciferase example that you gave us to GPCRs. Um, I'm assuming you found that you found the GPCRs as fascinating as the Firefly. Before you answer that, I would just want to say, even now when I see Fireflies, I'm still fascinated, knowing that it's a chemical reaction, but they're just beautiful. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel the same. <laughs> so, yeah, yes, so, the, the the excitement about t- taste receptors. Yes, uh, so uh, when we started working, like. Uh, in general, like GPCRs. So when I came to know that there are more than 800 GPCRs and I was like uh, shocked. Uh, so, you know, there are so many and uh, uh, my PhD supervisor, because I don't know much because when I was in grad school, uh, it's not like GPCRs, we just learn basics. Uh, but uh, like, fortunately this semester, I taught undergrads uh, the signal transduction. But when I see the textbooks now, they have so much information, but at that time, not much is known. So I just know these are uh, transmembrane proteins and which do basic signaling. Uh, but uh, when I joined the lab, my PhD supervisor, he told uh, like, you know, GPCRs, you, uh, you touch anything, uh, or you know, you touch any cell type or tissue or any function, so you can't uh, you know rule out the involvement of GPCRs. So that's how uh, important and uh, that's how ubiquitous they are. So I was like, oh wow! So that, uh, before that, we think only you know this is involved in only this type of you know in grad school. That's how we were taught. Uh, so when it comes to T2Rs, it's uh, uh, more interesting uh, because there are 25 and uh, uh, still we are not sure we know the endogenous ligands for all these T2Rs. And there are 25 and uh, we can't say one sim- one agonist can activate only one uh, uh, T2R. It can activate multiple and as much as the GPCRs are diverse, the T2Rs are, are also diverse, like they can be activated by simple peptides and, you know, alkaloids, terpenoids, and you take it, um, even many synthetic pharmacological compounds, uh, they all can be activated by T2Rs and even the signal transduction. So initially we thought they're present only in the, t- involved in the taste buds, but we know now they're like, they're present everywhere, just like GPCRs, these T2Rs are, uh, present in uh, smooth muscle, like, you know, intestine, uh, brain, and uh, you know, everywhere, reproductive system. Yeah, you just name it, uh, they're everywhere. And uh, yeah, still I'm so much uh, fascinated, you know, about this T2Rs, uh, but now I moved into a different area of research. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so that's how... So, so- that that sounds great, and actually, that was my next question. Where are these uh, receptors expressed? And I've talked, I've spoken with uh, with Dr. Mashaniv, and I've also spoken with with other taste receptor experts. And I kind of knew that they were not only in the taste buds, 
but then um, once, what was the major uh, discovery that you made during your PhD? So for me, like, uh, so I worked on a specific uh, uh, sub, sub type that is a T2R4. So for me, the major uh, discovery was like, we find the first constitutively active mutant in these taste receptors. So, and also uh, I found uh, further specifically for this subtype, I identified the first antagonist mm -hmm. and uh, inverse agonist for these uh, specific receptors. So for me, that's what the major, uh, you know, uh, discovered, I would say from my uh, perspective. And uh, we also characterized uh, the conserved residues, uh, like, you know, as you know, in GPCRs, like, you know, we have conserved residues in different transmembrane. So we kind of uh, did a big uh, sequence alignment between the species and we came up with uh, specific residues in different uh, transmembrane regions and try to understand their mechanism, you know, how these uh, T2Rs are uh, activated. Yeah, it's that's, still- That's so, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah, still there is a lot of mystery, like uh, hoping someday we will see a crystal structure or a crime structure of uh, this t 2 hopefully sometime soon. Yes, I think I think with, with the revolution in cryo-EM, um, things have sped up. I was talking to uh, Dr. Filizola uh, and we were talking about the first structure coming that came out in 2000 and then from 2007, it's the rest as we characterize it. Although all of those structures are very important, but there's so many that you know, you needed you need a database uh, like GPCRDB to uh, to keep track of that, and it's also as as you you made you made a very interesting point saying that you know you really characterized uh, these binders and their properties to to your receptor, and that is important to better understand the function of of these receptors. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. after, oh, please, I was yeah, going to yeah, say I, after after your PhD, uh, what made you you know, go to, to NIH? So, yeah, <laughs> that's a very interesting question. So, you know, after, you know, that's like, you know, when I was in PhD, that's the, I think, at least in my mind, that's the time it's kind of GPCR's crystal, crystallography kind of revolutionized. Like we see every month, uh, you know, a science or a nature paper where the crystal structure of GPCRs are just uh, coming, you know, left and right. So, I into like when I completed during the last year of my PhD, like uh, I have two options. So I should go for the, uh, you know, structural biology aspects of GPCRs or I should go more, uh, you know, in vivo or, um, you know, try to understand the physiological relevance of these receptors. So somehow, uh, you know, I tried to make a list and I thought maybe I would uh, go for, you know, try to understand the physiological relevance of these receptors, so which can be more lead to the you know uh, drug discovery and uh, you know structural aspects are important. Uh, with the help of uh, as already structural biology is like revolutionized or coming so much. So if we focus, if I can focus on the pharmacological aspects and you know drug discovery aspects and you know understand the physiological relevance, I thought that would be uh, useful for my future you know career. So then, you know, and, and as you know, Jurgen Wess is, you know, he's known for his work on uh, metabolic disorders and GPCRs. Uh, so then I approached him and uh, luckily uh, he gave me the opportunity. Uh, but after joining, I used to ask him so many times, like, you know, because uh, prior to that, I never worked with the uh, uh, rodent model, like I never touched, uh, you know, my so uh, it's I, I would say I was fortunate that uh, he gave me the opportunity you know to uh, work and yeah that's how I made my move towards this field. Did you um, did you apply to different labs? I'm asking this because a lot of our uh, our audience are you know PhD students, postdocs, and whenever it comes to making important career decisions, sometimes it's good to hear what others have done and what was their their thinking uh, when when they made that that move so were you did you look for other opportunities and the the work with dr west was more interesting or how did that happen so uh, i was um, i want to go for the you know study the physiological relevance of these receptors so basically i contacted only uh, two three labs so um, 
I would say I waited like almost like six months uh, to join, uh, like to have a op opening in Dr. West lab. And uh, once uh, there was an opening, then uh, I joined there. So what I'm trying to say is like, uh, I didn't approach multiple labs. So I, I wanted, uh, I want to be in that particular field. So um, I just approached two, three labs and I waited like once I got uh, like, you know, now there are no openings. So I waited for some time uh, and then again approached. So when there was an opening, I applied and luckily I got into the program at any age. So that, that's, and that's great. I think, I think that's also, that's very good advice. So you basically knew where you wanted to go. You knew what you, what you wanted to do. And then you mapped out where you'd like potentially to go. And then you waited out until the position in Dr. West's lab opened. And that's, that's what you want. And that's, that's very important as well, because it's important to know what you want. And yes. then plan, map out, you know, from where you are, what you want and where you want to go. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I kind of started, sorry, I kind of started almost one year before. So, you know, I will, I make sure I have enough time uh, because it's good to finish uh, the PhD also in time. It's, you know, otherwise. Yeah. So. yeah I, th I think that's also a great point is really taking your time and then starting ahead of time looking for these positions because all of these things take time, especially if you're going abroad, there are these visa issues, wherever you're going, if you're changing countries, there might be some visa issues um, that, that need to be solved. And sometimes it's easy, quote unquote, easy to find a lab that you like, they can say, yes, come, but then bureaucracy just takes over and then it takes forever to for the paperwork to, to happen. Yeah, as you mentioned rightly, yeah, it's like um, I got offer in, uh, in January. So, but the whole paperwork and uh, you know, as I'm from India, then I was in Canada and then moved to US and that to in a federal lab. So you know, uh, it took really some time. And like you, you also know because you also found it in it. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it really took some time. So yeah, so. yeah. Me too. Me too. So when I finished my postdoc in New York, getting to do my first postdoc in New York, the paperwork was, you know, 24 hours and it was done uh, because I'm Canadian. But then moving to the U.S. is one thing, but then moving into a federal uh, lab setting, it's there is more there is more red tape. There is more paperwork. And it took uh, over six months. For yeah. my visa and my for my paperwork to process, and I was already in the U.S., so um, it, it is what it is. But uh, it was a great experience uh, anyway. Okay, so you you moved to NIH. I guess the change in temperature again. <laughs> how, how well did you adjust from Winnipeg to to Bethesda, temperature wise? Yeah. So yeah, it's it's great. So uh, you know. Winnipeg is different and uh, Bethesda it's, you know, for me, it's every time it's a new cultural shock. So in Canada and Winnipeg, it's, you know, you know, like it's very calm and, you know, the way people interact and talk, uh, you know, it's like so polite. So even when I came to Canada first time, like it, it took some time for me to understand what people are really trying to say because they never say no. <laughs> So <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah so, say, oh, maybe, and maybe yeah, typically yeah. means no. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, you know, I really don't know that. So <laughs> it took some time. But in US and uh, at NIH, and uh, it's it's a different uh, ball game altogether. So you know, here, uh, you you have project and you have everything you need, and uh, you just start working from day one. So. Yeah, so fortunately, like um, I have uh, good colleagues and a great mentor. And uh, in terms of temperature, it's a. Uh, I used to roam just with t-shirt <laughs> initially <laughs> when it was like you know a little bit cold. So people used like the lab people they used to say, "Oh, you don't get like you don't feel cold, like you know cold." I'm like, hey, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to <laughs> just. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's yeah, but the weather is good. Yeah, Bethesda is yeah, it's great. It's, place. it's yeah, it's a huge temperature shock yeah. uh, from from Winnipeg to to Bethesda, yeah. definitely. 
less less snow, less wind chill, and uh, it's, yeah. it's pretty pretty nice. So during your your postdoc, um, uh, remind me again. I'm sorry, and I forgot this. I know you you changed receptors of interest. You changed a little bit more the field. So you're interested yeah. in the physiological effects of of GPCRs. What did you work about on uh, in Bethesda? So. So Jurgen West lab, like Jurgen's lab basically try to un- work on like understand the role of GPCRs and the beta arrestins uh, in uh, context of diabetes and obesity. Uh, so, you know, uh, and mostly most of the work is, uh, you know, done in rodent models and transgenic animals. So uh, I worked on uh, understanding the role of beta arrestins, uh, beta arrestin one and two. Uh, specifically in uh, adipose tissue and also in uh, you know, hypothalamus, like you know, hypothalamic neuronal population called PCRP neurons, and uh, try to understand uh, you know uh, how these uh, proteins uh, involved or regulate the uh, whole body glucose and energy homeostasis. So this is just you know in, if I put it in a nutshell, this is what basically uh, I try to study in uh, six years, six, six, and, like, six and a half years uh, mm-hmm. because of the COVID. Uh, yes. So you worked at NIH. <laughs> yes. And then you took on this uh, this interest in GPCRs and, and GPCR signaling in diabetes and obesity to open your own uh, lab. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so in PhD, I learned about uh, structure and function, uh, you know, how to understand the structure and function of HGPCR and in the postdoc uh, uh, where I focused mainly on uh, working with uh, rodent models and try to understand the physiology uh, still I'm trying to understand like uh, <laughs> and, you're not the uh, only one <laughs> <laughs> and, I don't think uh, you're the only one we're all trying to understand the physiology <laughs> it's, uh, it's very complex <laughs> you never get hold of it uh, not even the basics <laughs> Uh, so, uh, and I want uh, so as I worked on uh, adipose tissue and uh, I tried to understand what different other cell type which is present in the adipose tissue, like for instance, immune cells. So as an independent uh, PI uh, at IIT Kanpur, uh, I, like, I'm planning to, still I need to start my lab. Uh, I'm planning to uh, study on uh, role of GPCRs. Uh, in uh, immune cells, um, that's what the bigger picture is. So, uh, if I go more in detail, like we try to understand uh, how the uh, tissue resident immune cells, uh, you know, in different tissues like uh, adipose tissue, skeletal muscle, liver, pancreas, and how these immune cells um, regulate uh, the function of other cell types, and as my core interest is GPCR, so I want to know how these GPCRs uh, signaling pathways um, in these immune cells can regulate other cell types and how it can affect the whole glucose and energy homeostasis uh, in an that's, animal. And yeah, that's I think that's very interesting and it's something very unique as well. And we definitely need to to understand how these cells and different tissues interact. And which, which you know, I was listening to to this podcast, and they were talking about, um, you know, adipose tissue and and fat cells. And for a long time, we thought, you know, they they're not nothing is going on in there. But actually, it's not true. It's an organ in itself. Yeah, fat is not bad. Uh, actually, exactly. <laughs> and uh, it need, it releases so many, you know, adipokines and cytokines, which are essential. Uh, for the basic function and the physiology, so which I think it's it's understudied. So uh, thank you, thank you for taking on this this huge task. Thank you. <laughs> hopefully, no. we will. No, please go ahead. Uh, no, I'm just saying. Hopefully, we will, you know, do some uh, good work and yeah, come up with some good interventions. <laughs> Fantastic. So the, my next question was, and I asked this from everyone. Now that you've Kind of walked us through uh, through your career and the science that you've been doing in the different labs where you were training. I have to ask, what is your favorite GPCR? If okay. you have one, uh, favorite GPCR, like okay, so I like T2Rs 
and I also like beta arrestings. So <laughs> okay, uh, we'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like the tattoo arts because they're so diverse and uh, you know uh, they're expressed everywhere, and still we don't know their function in detail, and uh, still like. Uh, if i say that like this 25 uh, gpcs are activated by more than 1000 uh, ligands and uh, still um, we can't say like um, well, this agonist can activate only this particular ttr like you know the specificity is like uh, not uh, to an extent that where we can say this is very selective and uh, yeah same thing with beta arresting so so you know initially we thought the beta arrestings are just involved in internalization and desensitization but uh, and uh, you just name any uh, you know physiological or any pathway so these guys will just uh, you know uh, come in and then regulate the function and then it's uh, with every day passing we are getting more and more information about uh, arrestings and how they regulate the function and yes even in my post doc like um, uh, different projects like in one project we found that they're involved in classical pathway in other we found that they're involved in insulin signaling and other we found that they're involved at the transcription level so uh, so it's very <laughs> very interesting so yes so it's not not only a gpcr world it's also a beta rest in world yes yeah <laughs> I oh, think that's, that's, that's the, when, sorry i think that's the beauty of um, this gpcrs and beta arresting so which makes them a good targets you know in combination so we have biased yeah. towards g protein or we can make biased uh, the drugs towards beta arresting and then yeah. yeah so um you mentioned uh, the the taste receptors and t2rs um are there any t2rs expressed in the t- in the adipose tissues or in the immune cells oh, so, are you going to be working on on t2rs okay, so so uh, yeah so like uh, with respect to my future work so uh, uh, what at least at this point what i am thinking is like i don't want to target a specific uh, subset of gpcrs uh, i want to uh, explore uh, all type of gpcs so the reason for saying like there are two things one is um, because now we have single cell sequencing technology uh, with that we can identify different uh, subsets of uh, cell types like uh, within like for instance if we take macrophages uh, um, with the single cell seq we can find uh, within the adipose tissue there are uh, three or four or maybe in the future we'll find more subsets of uh, macrophages and uh, what i'm hypothesizing is that um, these subsets may have a uh, different gpcr expression profile and uh, we would like to uh, it's like as adipose tissue not all adipocytes are bad it's not all immune cells are you know it's not all pro inflammatory or anti inflammatory so there are other types too so we want to target those cell types and uh, target the gpcrs that are specific for those subset of cells and uh, you know use that information and uh, try to you know improve the glucose uh, or metabolism in the animal models and then if we can see um, and next other thing is like uh, similarly we want to focus more on indian population Uh, so as we know the, you know the gpcr expression profile also changes uh, within different set of uh, you know ethnic groups and you know even within the population we see different regions we have so we want to explore uh, these options and um, we want to work more uh, in terms of uh, india centric so we want to screen in these immune cells what are the different gpcrs expressed in the indian population within the indian population different regions so as in it's very diverse so uh, and try to get that information and uh, use that information to develop better pharmacological interventions so I that's my it. bigger picture that, but <laughs> that's your spell i love it because because i it 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 is quote unquote receptor family agnostic and you're really looking at a global view and whatever the data that you get back tells you that's what you're going to decide to follow which i think it's it's a, it's great 
you know, the data never lies. The data is not biased. It is the yeah. data. Yeah. So at this moment, I'm not thinking about, uh, you know, any GPCR or any okay. RSTN or nothing. So I'm like, so whatever comes, I will just uh, pick that and then pursue yeah. it further. So. I love it. I love it. So we talked a little bit about uh, during your PhD, uh, what what were your major discoveries? And also, I always ask this from everyone throughout your career up until now, uh, what would you qualify as aha moments? Something that happened that either redefined your career or, uh, you know, it can be something very minimal. You saw a, a piece of evidence and you said, oh, well, I just changing um, my way of thinking. I think the Firefly Luciferase example is is one of those when you actually see light and it's actually due to a chemical reaction. Yeah, yeah, that was one. <laughs> uh, <if it laughs> so that's comes, done. <laughs> yeah, the first one, and uh, then yeah, during the PhD that uh, you know, and in the undergrad and in grad school, like uh, you know, like any other student, you don't really see a big picture, like how your research can impact. And uh, uh, when I was in grad, like PhD, doing PhD, so uh, when I was working on this, like each uh, day, like, you know, you try to identify a new thing uh, that will lead to a new project. Uh, so that's kind of uh, very, like, uh, it's a great moment for me. Like, you know, I started one project, then, for instance, like, um, we discovered the constantly active mutant. Uh, in the TTR4. So that helped me to identify uh, first inverse agonist. You know, if there is no CAM, it would be difficult for me to, you know, identify, you know, the inverse agonist. So so that is one thing, like, uh, you know, when I sit back and say, oh, like, at that time I didn't realize, but, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, when I think later, it's like, okay, this is how science works. Yeah, you, you like you learn every day, so so that's what I learned. And even in a postdoc, and how the uh, discoveries, uh, you know, the basic discoveries um, that we do, uh, you know, the uh, simple mutational studies or whatever, and that can lead to the uh, in terms of uh, physiological and translation. It so uh, you know used. In like in PhD, I studied more slain cell systems, but uh, when I started working uh, you know, Jurgen's lab as a postdoc, so I worked on dreads too. So you just give the CNO compound, and then uh, you see the glucose, you know, goes up and down in the animal, and you're like, wow. So you know, you just read in the book, but when you do uh, in animal, and you see those changes just on your glucometer, it's yeah, it's it's really great. So yeah, these are the few instincts I would say that I really that's, see. Ten. <laughs> that's that's fantastic, and you made you know you made a great point by mentioning that it, although it may seem that you're just working on your quote unquote little project, but um, always taking a step back and focusing on the impact of of your work in general on the field and on the you know on science, uh, it's something important to do because. For so many times you go to the lab, you do experiments, you work late, you work a lot, and then nothing works. But then when you finally get it to work, it's just not, it's not a small thing. It's a big thing. It's very important. And it's the collective uh, information that we all put on the table, so to say, uh, is what, what really, you know, fortifies the field. I totally agree with that. <laughs> Well, um, since you you recently transitioned uh, to to a PI position, what would be your advice for for junior scientists who would like to you know either stay in academia but also contribute to the field in any way? Uh, any any additional great advice? You've already uh, mentioned the fact that you you really got ready to transition from your PhD to your postdoc, and then you took that one year of preparation. But what else would you? Uh, what other wisdom would you impart us? So one thing I would say, like, you know, when I started postdoc, um, you know, you're not, you don't know what really happens uh, down the line five years. Like, uh, you don't, because ultimately, you know, you need good uh, publications. And to if you want to get into academia or good industry, or like, you need set up good skills as well as good publications. So at that time, I really don't know. And uh, when, like, when I was 
doing the postdoc, you get publications, but you really don't know where you stand. So at least in my case, the confidence level is not up to the mark. Like, oh, you know, I'm good or, you know, I'm good to be PI, uh, you know, I'm not. Then you talk to different uh, people. And then I think it's very important to talk to different people and who just started the career and also the seniors, like, you know, senior professors. Uh, it's important to talk to both. So we get a different, you know, perspective, like how they look at things. And uh, um, important thing is, I think uh, I would say is be confident. Uh, so I realized that uh, once I started giving uh, interviews at different places, so then I realized, okay, okay, it's not bad. It's uh, it, it's at least uh, you know not as bad as I thought. So so people are interested in your work and uh, people appreciate. So I think that is very important and uh, be confident and then just apply and uh, try sooner. And uh, and also, I think, I don't know, at least in India, like uh, I was told that like sometimes people say that you have to wait for all your publications to be out. And uh, it's I think it's not necessary. You need to wait till that point. Uh, if you know where your stories are ending and, uh, you know, if you can uh, approach, you can approach people and be in touch with them and try to update about your publications. And this is what, this is my journey. I'm not giving advice, but this is what happened in my case, at least. <laughs> I think I think you, you gave fantastic advice and I think you made many, many great points. One about confidence and um, the fact that I think confidence is something, you're not born with confidence, you gain confidence by going outside, by being exposed, you know, talking to people, going to conferences and, you know, standing by your poster may seem like, oh, oh my God, you know, you did all the work. It took you a week or two to put together the poster because you are pipetting at the, at the same time. And then in my case, you know, it's always running, you know, getting the poster printed and then you go to the conference and you feel like, oh my God, and now you have to talk to people. But that's the most important part is, you know, to see what kind of conversations you can get. And that builds confidence. If you have, you know, somebody with 30, 40 years of experience who stops at your poster, yes, it is intimidating, but it also builds your confidence. So that was the point number one. Point number two that you, I think it was just amazing that you made is the fact that um, a lot of times it's all in your head <laughs> and, you know, just, just forget what your brain tells you, just go out there and see what people say to it. And, you know, you've done the work. So in the work that you're presenting, you are the ultimate expert. It's not your PI. It's not somebody else. You did the work and then you, you know, taking ownership of that work and having just follow the data and present your work. And then point number three, that I thought was very, uh, very spot on was the fact that you do not have to wait for all your papers to be accepted or all your papers to be out in order to start planning out and mapping out what you want to do. And there's always that risk, I feel like, when, you know, you finish the work, you've submitted the paper, and then there's that risk of what happens if I leave and it comes back with, you know, a year worth of experiment. Uh, but there is that fine balance that you need to find. And I think, you know, you made a fantastic uh, couple of points and just, just go out there, talk to people. Worst case that can happen is that it's not going to work out. But um, I was I was talking to to someone earlier this week and there was this famous Wayne Gretzky um, um, quotes that you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take, which I thought was a really, <laughs> you know, and it get it takes us back to, to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think, I think that those are, those are very important points that you made. And for someone who recently transitioned to, to become a PI, uh, that's fantastic advice to anyone listening who wants to, uh, you know, plan out and map out what they want to do and need a, just a little bit of boost of confidence here. So last but not least, my last uh, question for you is, since you just opened up your uh, your lab, if and when you have job openings, where can people find you? So I will put it on my lab website and I'll post on LinkedIn and uh, also on Twitter. So yeah, so, and maybe I'll reach to you. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, absolutely. So I was going to say we do have a career page and it's drgpcr.com slash career. You just have to fill out that little Google form and we'll be happy to uh, to post it. And we, we've we started, um, you know, advertising this on social media as well. Um, so I would invite anyone uh, who would like to uh, talk to you or you know, join join your team just to reach out. You will have this episode will have its own standalone page with every possible link where people can find you. But definitely, um, I look forward to uh, to talking to you maybe in a year or two and see uh, the progress that you made and kind of figure out what GPCRs you narrowed down your interest to based <laughs> on the uh, single cell seek. Yeah, hopefully, I yeah, will make some progress in the next two years. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I'm sure I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. Well, with this, thank you so much, Sai, for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much uh, for hosting me. It's really nice talking to you. And once again, you know, uh, bringing up the whole GPCR community together, it's a easy way to get in touch uh, with people and, you know, know about their career path. It's not just, you know, normally we just see their papers, but uh, we really don't know what happens, you know, behind that. So, with your uh, you know help and we can you know we are doing that i guess and uh, thank you thank very you much soon. thank you all right i'll talk to you soon sai thanks bye bye thank you for joining us for this dr gpcr podcast episode we'd like to thank our guest as well as our team members atila forest ines pinero and alexa truan please subscribe to the dr gpcr newsletter today and find us on youtube as well if you like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. You can also leave us a testimonial at drgpcr.com slash testimonials. Another great way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. Email us with any questions or suggestions at hello at drgpcr.com. Until next time, stay safe. Stay safe.